Still having fun with the Spring into the to Adventure uh, Booktube reading um, event. One of the prompts, I think it's for the, I think it's the third prompt, and I don't know. I'll try and put this up in the appropriate week, but I don't know. I've been messing up my my posting dates a lot. Is to read a nonfiction uh, adventure. Oh, I think it's the fourth prompt. Come to think of it, because the third prompt will be watching the movie Robin Hood, which by the time this goes up, I should have done already, but I haven't. Um, and I found one I wanted to read. In this, I've got this collection, this little uh, um, ebook uh, omnibus of Robert Louis Stevenson stories. The first one is called An Inla Inland Voyage, which is a travelogue. That's about a trip he and a friend made when Stevenson was only 26. This is apparently how he, uh, according to Wikipedia, how he started his, how he wanted to start his writing career. He, let me see what it says here. I think it's pretty good, actually. As a young man, Stevenson desired to be financially independent so that he might pursue the woman he loved and set about funding his freedom from parental support by writing travelogues, the three most prominent being an inland voyage, you know, followed by a couple others. He, so he takes this voyage um, for the purpose of writing about it. It's a canoe trip that he and his friend, Sir Walter Grinley Simpson, took in uh, fall of 1876. It's on the Oise, O-I-S-E, the Oise, River, I think, uh, from Belgium through France. And it's uh, not a very long book. It's really enjoyable. It's kind of pastoral. They're, they're in these, they've each got a canoe and they're going down um, the river, which was a pretty rare sight at that time. There weren't a lot of people doing that kind of uh, uh, rough traveling, at, you know, in that part of the world at that time. And most people assumed they were peddlers of some kind. And they were quite, uh, uh, source of fascination to uh, people that came across, you know, villages would come out and gawk at them, wave them, wave, wave them goodbye when they left and things because it was such a event, you know, they meet people who've never been out of their own village and that kind of thing. They also, you know, go to some larger cities. They're not really roughing it. They're not camping or anything. They pull up their canoes when they find a tavern or an inn they can stay at and sometimes they stay in big hotels. And they have the kind of adventures that you have that kind of thing, a lot of stuff about weather and food and being really enjoying the food after a hard day's rowing. Um, it's it's very, it's like comfort reading, you know. It's like just fun, fun to read about the, this little adventure they're having, nothing bad happens. You know, it's nonfiction, nothing bad happens. They, it talk, talks a lot about the things they uh, find along the way. It's typical travel writing in that sense that, you know, they visit a lot of cathedrals and stuff. He has a lot of observations uh, about different things they see. It's very charming and just fun to read. It's perfect for like a lazy afternoon read. It's about 120 pages or so. And I didn't know much about Stevenson's life. I still don't know much. I looked it up on Wikipedia because I was just kind of curious, first of all, what, what part of this life he was. He, he, what, what part of his life this took place in, and like I say, he was very young, he was 26 years old. There's a passage in here about the flow state, which I thought was pretty interesting, so I'm going to read it, or try and read it. Um, again, they spend the, most of the day, every day, just rowing, rowing their canoes, and uh, going from place to place. Canoeing was easy work. The dip to dip the paddle at the proper inclination, now right, now left, to keep the head downstream, to empty a little pool that gathered in the lap of the apron, to screw up the eyes against the glittering sparkles of sun upon the water, or now and again to pass below the whistling tow rope of the Deo Gratius of Condi or the four sons of Amon. There was not much art in that. Certain, certain silly muscles managed it between sleep and waking, and meanwhile the brain had a whole holiday and went to sleep. We took in at a glance the larger features of the scene and beheld with half an eye blouseed fishers and dabbling washerwomen on the bank, 
Now and again, we might be half awakened by some church spire, by a leaping fish, or by a trailer, or by a trail of river grass that clung about the paddle and had to be plucked off and thrown away. But these luminous intervals were only partially luminous. A little more of us was called into action, but never the whole. The Central Bureau of Nerves, which in some moods we call ourselves, enjoyed its holiday without disturbance, like a government office. The great wheels of intelligence turned idly in the head, like flywheels grinding no grist. I have gone on for half an hour at a time, counting my strokes and forgetting the hundreds. I flatter myself the beasts I flatter myself the beasts that perish could not underbid that as a low form of consciousness. And what a pleasure it was, what a hearty, tolerant temper did it bring about. There is nothing captious about a man who has attained to this, the one possible apotheosis in life, the apothe the apotheosis of stupidity. And he begins to feel dignified and longevous like a tree. Long living, I suppose. There was one odd piece of practical metaphysics which accompanied what I may call the depth, if I must not call it the intensity, of my abstraction. What philosophers call me and not me, ego and non-ego, preoccupied me whether I would or no. There was less me and more not me than I was accustomed to expect. I looked up upon somebody else who managed the paddling. I was aware of somebody else's feet against the stretcher. My own body seemed to have no more intimate relation to me than the canoe or the river or the river banks. Nor this alone, something inside my mind, a part of my brain, a province of my proper being, had thrown off allegiance and set up for itself, or perhaps for the somebody else who did the paddling. I had dwindled into quite a little thing in a corner of myself. I was isolated in my skull. Thoughts presented themselves unbidden. They were not my thoughts. They were plainly someone else's. I considered them like a part of the landscape. I take it in short that I was about as near nirvana as would be convenient in practical life. And if this be so, I make the Buddhists my sincere compliments. Tis an agreeable state not very consistent with mental brilliancy, not exactly profitable in a money point of view, but very calm, golden, and incurious, and one that sets a man's superior to alarms. It may be best figured by supposing yourself to get dead drunk and yet keep sober to enjoy it. I have a notion that open-air laborers must spend a large portion of their days in this ecstatic stupor, which explains their high composure and their endurance. A pity to go to the expense of laudanum when here is a better paradise for nothing. And it goes on even there. I think that's probably enough of listening to me read, but I, uh, like I said, I recommend it. I, I'm glad I read it. I've got some more things I'm gonna read in this same, I'll probably read The Body Snatcher in the same collection. It's quite an eclectic collection, as you can see, but that's Stevenson, right? The collection has two of his boys' adventure novels, what would be called uh, YA or Middle Grade or something today, which is Kidnapped in Treasure Island. It's got one of his romances, The Black Arrow, I think, is in it. And it's got two of his horror stories, The um, Jekyll and Hyde, which I've read before, and The Body Snatcher, which I'm pretty sure is probably based on the same uh, uh, that so many horror stories and, and macabre mystery stories are based on from that time of, of the Burke and Hare affair but I'll find out because I'm going to read that 